continue with uh, the debate on the future of uh, cohesion policy. I would kindly ask you to take your seats and to have some quiet in the hemicycle, please. I would like to welcome our guests of honor, Elisa Ferreira, the Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms and a good friend of the European Committee of Regions, Mercedes Caballero Fernandez, the Spanish Secretary General for European Funds, Elio Di Rupo, our member, Minister President of the Valon Government and member of the COR, and Yumus Omarje, the Chair of the Committee on Regional Development of the European Parliament. Dear uh, Commissioner Ferreira, as introduction to our debate today, I would like to begin by expressing my hope that you, Commissioner Ferreira, will not be the last European Commissioner for Cohesion Policy. This hope is more than a mere wish. It's a cautionary note. While we discuss the future of cohesion policy today, several member states are actively considering new governance structures for the future of European funds, transitioning from a partnership model to a governance system modeled on the top-down approach seen in the Recovery and Resilience Fund. This is, in my view, a significant mistake. In fact, it would be a tragedy for Europe. Cohesion policy reforms and indeed does perform a rich history of promoting economic, social and territorial development, playing a crucial role in realizing key projects that benefit citizens, benefit communities and small, medium-sized companies. It has a wealth of best practices to share and good governance principles to uphold, particularly the partnership principle that embodies multi-level governance. Its recent history demonstrates its ability to adapt and be flexible in the face of new needs and emergencies, such as during the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. We understand but for cohesion policy to remain effective in the long run, it must evolve further to align with changing times. Point is that cohesion has already embraced a performance-oriented approach through the last reform, emphasizing green and digital investments. What more? Looking ahead, we shall not further seek only for simplification or a new shift in focus. Rather, what's needed is a genuine financial boost as a future financial framework based on the existing one would no longer surface. And a confirmation of the current governance which is locally driven. Rethinking the resources of cohesion is not only needed because the policy has become a fertile tool designed to address numerous global challenges but it is also due to the implementing and the impending enlargement of the European Union. Indeed, we cannot afford a mere reallocation of resources to newcomers, as the statistical effect caused by a new enlargement on our region would not address alone the root causes of existing territorial disparities. So, in conclusion, let's return to the fundamental aspect of our policy territoriality. To achieve this, we must indeed move beyond GDP to level the playing field. Now, going back to the fundamental also means adhering to a cohesion policy built from the bottom up, resisting the temptation of a top-down approach that would be too distant from the citizens and the local authorities' real needs to be efficient. If we want to tackle the emergencies, if we want to be able to respond to the real needs of citizens, of cities and regions, then we need cohesion policy to be in the front line of European policies, just as it is right now. Any change 
would create problems not only to citizen regions and to citizens' lives, but will help the anti-European voices and the anti-European sentiment rise again in the European Union's member states. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the views of our guests today, but also to hearing from you all as members of the Committee of Regions. Before starting and opening the floor, we will have a short video to show you. Cohesion policy reduces regional disparities by supporting concrete changes that impact and improve the life of citizens. Amid social, economic and environmental challenges, it is more important than ever to leave no one behind. From cities to villages, from mountains to islands, investments have to match territorial needs and evolving challenges. Cohesion is a fundamental European value that is crucial to ensure a sustainable future for all. Commissioner Ferreira, thank you for joining us today. You have the floor now for five minutes. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, um, uh, dear Chair Chichikostas, uh, dear President Cordeiro, dear uh, uh, Secretary General Mercedes Caballero, 
Um, dear uh, Elio de Rupio, Minister President of uh, Valonia, and in anticipation of the Belgian Presidency, um, Chair Omaji, Honourable Members, um, my thanks uh, to the Committee of the Regions and especially to the two rapporteurs uh, that have uh, addressed this question, how can we improve the performance of cohesion policy? Because uh, if we want really to keep the policy going, we have got to be able to preserve what needs to be preserved and to update what needs to be updated. And this is a way to preserve it, together with making sure that the good examples of what we do with the policy are visible to everybody, and that really we bring forward the, uh, the, the will of European citizens and support of the European citizens to the policy. Looking at your report, uh, yours is the first comprehensive institutional position on the future of cohesion policy. The direct involvement of the President of the Committee and the Chair of COTER, and that I didn't mention before but is quite visible, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bock, reflects once again the remarkable commitment of this institution to cohesion policy. And this is, in fact, essential. Highly appreciate it. We appreciate, too, the report's very solid analysis of the challenges to cohesion as well as recommendations for the legal architecture of the policy, for governance and delivery, and for the policy's contribution to the various territorial transformations driven by innovation, climate, and demography. These recommendations that are uh, expressed in your report are invaluable for our ongoing reflections, and we are examining them very, very closely. We agree that an European Union without cohesion policy would, for sure, be a fragmented one. We cannot be united if we have strong disparities that will only increase if nothing is done about them. And we agree also that the policy is essential, not just for reasons of solidarity, but for economic prosperity, for the strength and resilience of the single market, and for political stability. It is also the only tangible representation of the European project in some parts of our Union, and we just saw some of them in the film. Moreover, cohesion, both across and within Member States, is more needed than ever in times of external, very violent challenges and via very violent shocks. This is why the principle of do no harm to cohesion should be applied wherever relevant to all European and national policies and instruments. Strengthening cohesion cannot be the work only of cohesion policy. We very much appreciate your strong and consistent support also on this point. While it is too early to set out in detail the future framework of the policy, as we cannot preempt what the future Commission will propose, there are some reflections and recommendations that gather an emerging support. We agree with you that modernization is required to remain in step with the changing times, to boost the effectiveness of the policy, to rise to emerging challenges, and to meet the expectations of our citizens. We also agree on recommendations for simplification while bearing in mind that we still need to ensure sound management and regular expenditure. Cohesion policy should also increasingly be more performance-oriented and have clear links to reforms, because investments alone are not enough to trigger sustainable and inclusive development. But however this is done, we must preserve key success features of the current policy, notably the partnership principle and the multi-level governance. We are also interested in your ideas for a mechanism to respond to exceptional circumstances. This would certainly alleviate the pressures of on cohesion policy, which had in the recent past to intervene as a last resort during the crisis in the past years of COVID, of the uh, refugees from Ukraine, of the rise in energy prices, and of course, 
of course, we must retain the key focus of the policy on long-term transformation. But to be effective in promoting the very principle of cohesion, as well as the future of the policy, we also need to reach out to wider audiences. As we often speak among ourselves, preaching to the converted on the importance of the policy, we need, and this is my appeal to all of you, we need to go beyond this constituency and reach out more frequently to other decision makers, including the head of state and government level, our fellow citizens, and opinion makers outside our bubble. In terms of next steps, the high-level group on the future of cohesion policy that I launched early in the year will meet two more times, and their final report prepared under their direct responsibilities expected by the end of February next year. In parallel, policy dialogues have been conducted in the Member States, and we remain engaged in dialogue with all institutions and stakeholders, gathering evidence from studies, research and evaluations. We will draw these together in the ninth cohesion report, expected by the end of March, leading to a debate at the ninth cohesion forum in April. We Again, welcome very much your contributions in today's report, the report that uh, is the core subject of this session, as well as in the coming months. And I look forward to our continued and close cooperation, bearing all, always in mind that Europe cannot function if we don't have a strong and performant cohesion policy that keeps us together, that keeps Europe united, and this requires a place-based, multi-level policy in which cohesion is also shared at the level of the so-called horizontal policies, be them at the level of member states or at the level of the European Union. Thank you for your support. Your support is essential. Thank you for the support of the European Parliament as well and of all the friends of cohesion. And let's be open and speak out outside the bubble. This is my final message. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to give the floor now to Secretary General Caballero for five minutes. Here, thank you. Eh, querido Presidente Alves Cordeiro, querido Vicepresidente, eh, quería agradecer en primer lugar esta oportunidad que me brindan todos ustedes desde el Comité de las Regiones para participar en este debate que dará lugar a la aprobación del dictamen del Comité de las Regiones para el futuro de la política de cohesión. Es un placer para mí compartir una vez más este panel con mis colegas, la comisaria Ferreira, el presidente Elio Di Rupo y el presidente Llanos Omardí, a quienes brindo un especial saludo. Como saben, el futuro de la política de cohesión ha sido el eje central de la presidencia española del Consejo de la Unión Europea durante este semestre en materia de cohesión. Así lo puso de manifiesto la vicepresidenta cuarta del, del Gobierno, la ministra de Hacienda y Función Pública, María Jesús Montero, el pasado mes de septiembre en este mismo Parlamento Europeo. La reunión informal ministerial que celebramos en Murcia, a la que también asistió la Comisión Europea, también se centró en esta importante cuestión. Y, por supuesto, desde nuestra presidencia hemos querido contar con la visión de todas las instituciones y órganos consultivos de la Unión. Y comenzamos con el Comité de las Regiones. Yo mismo hablé con el presidente Alves Cordeiro hace unos meses ya para empezar a preparar lo que sería la petición de dictamen que realizamos en junio. E igualmente hemos solicitado informe al Comité, de las, eh, al Comité Económico y Social. El dictamen del Comité de las Regiones muestra la alta coincidencia de visiones que existen entre instituciones, gobiernos centrales, regiones y localidades sobre hacia dónde debe avanzar la política de cohesión más allá de 2027. Una política de cohesión que debe seguir siendo ese pilar fundamental de la integración europea y que ha servido desde los inicios de este proceso como eje vertebrador del desarrollo y crecimiento, garantizando la convergencia de las regiones europeas y actuando bajo el principio fundamental de evitar dejar a nadie atrás.
En efecto, el proyecto de dictamen hace hincapié en la necesidad de que la política de cohesión, más allá de 2027, siga respondiendo a lo que es su objetivo último, tal y como está consagrado en el artículo 174 del Tratado de Funcionamiento de la Unión Europea, conseguir el desarrollo armonioso de las regiones. Asimismo, la política de cohesión debe seguir sirviendo como instrumento de solidaridad, pero permítanme, no solo de solidaridad, sino de integración y de construcción europea, de un presente y de un futuro comunes que permitan combatir la geografía del descontento. Ha de ser una política que sea visible y reconocible para los ciudadanos, locali eh, regiones y localidades que han de sentirla como propias. Por estas razones, para combatir esta geografía del descontento, es fundamental que la política de, de cohesión responda a las necesidades de las personas, de los ciudadanos, de las regiones. Y para ello, lo fundamental es conseguir un place-based approach y el principio general de «one size does not fit all». Esta es la manera fundamental. Tenemos que ser capaces de ajustar la programación que se realiza en materia de cohesión de verdad a las necesidades de cada región. Y hay que tener en cuenta en este sentido que una región que se encuentre en una misma categoría de regiones, convergencia, transición o más desarrollada, no tiene por qué partir de la misma situación originaria en muchos aspectos climáticos, geopolíticos, de tejido productivo, etc. Y que, por tanto, puede que su camino a la convergencia, estando incluso en el mismo apartado relativo de renta per cápita, no tenga por qué ser el mismo. En este sentido, durante la presidencia española hemos querido avanzar proponiendo que en el futuro se tengan en cuenta diferentes indicadores, diferentes elementos que a partir del análisis de datos nos permitan realizar un mejor diagnóstico de dónde partimos y hacia dónde vamos, preservando, por supuesto, el respeto a los objetivos políticos que entre todos nos, nos hemos marcado y nos vamos a seguir marcando. Otro elemento fundamental sobre el que hemos discutido y que hace referencia también el informe es sobre la necesidad de reducir los costes regulatorios. Las cargas burocráticas en cohesión al superponer sistemas son en ocasiones excesivas. Por tanto, un replanteamiento de nuevo acerca de cómo homogenizar procedimientos donde, sin perder control de ninguna de las maneras, pero consigamos reducir los costes regulatorios es algo fundamental. El control no es un fin en sí mismo, es un instrumento para garantizar una eficacia adecuada en la asignación de los recursos. Pero la política de cohesión también tiene que ser capaz, lo ha hecho gracias a la intervención de todas las instituciones de la Unión en el pasado, tiene que ser capaz de dar respuesta a los diferentes acontecimientos de carácter disruptivo que desgraciadamente se van a seguir produciendo. Se produjo la pandemia, después se produjo una guerra y es fácil que en el futuro, por ejemplo, los efectos del cambio climático acaben afectando más a unas zonas que a otras. Por tanto, podemos concluir diciendo que la política de cohesión se encuentra en un momento apasionante ante grandes oportunidades que le brindan las lecciones aprendidas de su propio desarrollo y de su gestión. En cuanto a la gestión, otro elemento básico a tener en cuenta y a poner en valor es la gestión compartida, que nos ha permitido crear unas instituciones de gobernanza entre países, entre regiones, entre entidades locales y, por supuesto, con la Comisión Europea y con el resto de las instituciones que creemos que es necesario preservar. Todas las instituciones de la Unión, los legisladores y gestores nacionales, regionales y locales aquí representados, estamos convencidos de la importancia de dotar a la política de cohesión de una eficacia y de una fuerza renovadas. Prueba de ello es precisamente el dictamen del Comité de las Regiones aquí presentado. Por ello, estoy segura de que entre todos seremos capaces de desarrollar los instrumentos que nos permitan sentar las bases de la política de cohesión del mañana para seguir construyendo una Europa de todos y todas donde no dejemos a nadie atrás. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. I would like to give the floor now to Minister President Di Rupo for five minutes. For Pinyar Power. Okay. Uh, merci. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm speaking in my language. Um, L'avenir de la politique de cohesion après 2027 
sera au cœur des priorités de la présidence belge. La présidence belge soulignera l'importance de la politique de cohésion, importance comme instrument essentiel d'investissement à long terme. On le dit souvent dans cette enceinte pour renforcer la convergence économique, sociale, territoriale des régions de l'Union européenne, comme on l'a vu sur la vidéo. Importance aussi comme instrument de réponse aux défis de la société, mais au niveau le plus proche des citoyens et des entreprises. Vous le savez, la politique de cohésion est un ciment de la construction européenne et ce ciment de la construction européenne dont nous avons plus que jamais besoin dans la période que nous connaissons. Les travaux de la présidence belge s'inscriront dans la poursuite des réflexions initiées sous les, présidentes, les précédentes présidences. Je voudrais saluer le travail remarquable réalisé par la présidence espagnole. Merci, Mercedes. Je salue également l'avis qui sera adopté dans quelques minutes par notre comité européen des régions sur l'avenir de la cohésion post-2027. Cet avis est un élément très important, comme vient de le dire la madame la commissaire, dans la réflexion que nous mènerons ensemble afin de renforcer la politique de cohésion. Pour ma part, il me semble que nous devrions répondre au plus vite à quelques questions fondamentales. Manifestement, certains décideurs européens tentent d'accaparer une partie plus ou moins importante du budget futur de la politique de cohésion. Et ce désir de puiser dans le budget cohésion pour d'autres politiques est grand. Il est d'autant plus grand que les États membres semblent ne pas vouloir accroître le budget global de l'Union ni permettre à l'Union de se financer par des recettes propres. Or, les besoins de l'Union sont énormes et nombreux, nous le savons. Par ailleurs, des voix se font également entendre pour assimiler la politique de cohésion avec la facilité pour la reprise et la résilience. Face à ces réalités, plusieurs questions peuvent se poser. Comment convaincre qu'une politique d'investissement structurel à long terme ne peut pas être confondue avec une politique de relance mise en place après un cataclysme ou une pandémie Comment simplifier la gouvernance des fonds structurels pour être plus efficient. Par ailleurs, nous le savons tous ici, les besoins d'une région ne sont pas totalement identiques aux besoins d'autres régions. Dès lors, comment garantir une meilleure prise en compte des spécificités de chaque région dans la définition des politiques de cohésion à mener sur chaque territoire spécifique Nous aurons des éléments de réponse lors de la publication du groupe de spécialistes de haut niveau sur l'avenir de la politique de la cohésion, présidé par le professeur Andrés Rodriguez Posé. En concertation avec la commissaire Ferreira, si elle accepte, je tenterai, durant, je tenterai durant la présidence belge de poser une série de questions qui s'imposent afin de faciliter le débat. Mes chers collègues, à mi-parcours de la présidence belge, la Commission publiera son neuvième rapport de cohésion. J'ai compris qu'il y aura un forum en avril. Ce sera, euh, cette publication, un autre élément important dans la conception de la politique de cohésion après 2027. L'objectif de la présidence belge est l'adoption de ses conclusions du, con du Conseil sur le neuvième rapport lors du Conseil Affaires Générales Cohésion du 18 juin 2024. Avant cela, nous tiendrons un échange de vues au niveau ministériel en février, lors de la réunion informelle des ministres en charge de la politique et de la cohésion. Réunion à laquelle le Comité européen des régions, Monsieur le Président, sera associé par votre intermédiaire. Enfin, la présidence belge co-organise également le dixième sommet des villes et régions avec le Comité européen des régions. Ce sommet se tiendra le 18 et le 19 mars prochain. Ce sommet sera notamment l'occasion de nouveaux échanges sur l'avenir de la politique de la cohésion 2027. Et bien entendu, mes chers collègues, vous y êtes tous très cordialement invités. Merci infiniment. Merci. Merci beaucoup. 
Monsieur Romarger, vous avez la parole pour cinq minutes, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le, le Président. Mesdames et, et Messieurs, en vos titres et qualité, permettez-moi de partager avec vous quelques, quelques messages. Tout d'abord, vous dire combien l'engagement le, du comité des, des régions est important et féliciter les, les co-rapporteurs Émile Bock et Vasco Cordero pour la contribution qu'ils mettent dans, dans le débat. Et cela nous renforce évidemment au Parlement européen dans les objectifs convergents que nous avons posés avec le comité des régions. Je veux vous dire que la cohésion est bien sûr une exigence, mais la cohésion doit d'abord et d'abord un combat, un combat permanent, un combat politique permanent. Et je veux vous dire mon inquiétude au moment où nous voyons rebondir partout en Europe des nationalismes, où nous voyons partout en Europe grandir au fur et à mesure des discours qui veulent séparer les États membres de l'Union européenne entre contributeurs nets d'un côté et les bénéficiaires de la politique de cohésion de l'autre. Et plus cet état d'esprit grandira, et plus les risques d'affaiblissement de la politique de cohésion grandiront avec. Parce que notre politique, vous le savez, est une politique d'abord et avant tout fondée sur la solidarité. Et c'est pourquoi le scrutin des européennes est un scrutin important parce qu'il va permettre de réaffirmer aussi la croyance dans un certain nombre de principes fondamentaux qui gouvernent l'ensemble des politiques européennes. Le deuxième élément que je souhaite mettre dans le débat, en plus de tout ce qui a déjà été dit et sur lequel je ne reviendrai pas parce que je partage tout ce qui a été dit, c'est que dans nos réflexions sur le futur de la cohésion, nous devons aussi penser aux futurs élargissements qui vont arriver, ainsi que les questions liées à la reconstruction de, de l'Ukraine et demain à l'adhésion de l'Ukraine sans doute à l'Union européenne. Il est évident que les pays nouveaux qui vont adhérer à l'Union européenne auront besoin d'une politique de cohésion, mais d'une politique de cohésion qui ne soit pas une politique rabou rabougrie et rabotée budgétairement mais d'une politique de cohésion très puissante. Mais nous devons aussi être lucides sur ces futurs élargissements qui vont venir, par effet mécanique, bousculer un certain nombre d'équilibres actuels. Et c'est pourquoi, dans les travaux qui sont engagés sur le futur de la politique de cohésion après 2027, nous devons intégrer cela parce que beaucoup de pays ou de régions qui sont aujourd'hui objectif 1 passeront dans d'autres catégories et les régions en transition risquent également de passer dans d'autres catégories. Donc gardons cela à l'esprit. Enfin, pour terminer, comme je l'ai plusieurs fois dit ici devant le comité des, des régions, je crois que vraiment, il nous faut à présent penser à un véritable pilier climatique, un pilier sur l'adaptation aux impacts du changement climatique dans les règlements sur la politique de, de cohésion, parce que les catastrophes naturelles et les impacts du réchauffement climatique vont venir bousculer tout ce que nous connaissons actuellement et venir bousculer tous les plans de développement régionaux à travers toute l'Union européenne. Vous pouvez évidemment compter sur l'engagement plein et entier du Parlement européen. 
Nous attendons évidemment avec intérêt les résultats des travaux des groupes d'experts, mais le futur de la politique de cohésion sera ce que les co-législateurs décideront, à savoir le Conseil européen et le Parlement européen. Nous avons porté la responsabilité des règlements qui sont actuellement assumés par les régions d'Europe. Nous tirons toutes les conséquences de ce qui a marché, de ce qui n'a pas marché, des évolutions qui devront être faites et nous proposerons également une proposition venant du Parlement européen sur la réforme de cette politique qui est devenue nécessaire. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Président Marger. I would like to give the floor now to the rapporteur, President Cordero, for three minutes. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente. Um, uma saudação à Sra. Comissária, um, Elisa Ferreira, e agradecer a sua presença hoje aqui. Uma saudação também a representantes da Presidência do Conselho, quer a atual, quer a próxima, e uma saudação especial também ao nosso amigo Yunus Omarji pela sua presença hoje aqui conosco. Um, algumas referências breves sobre este aspecto para continuar a servir as populações. A política de coesão não pode continuar imutável e exatamente como está. Um, nós apresentamos hoje uma proposta de parecer, uma proposta clara de renovação dessa política a fim de a tornar mais sólida e mais apetrechada para fazer face a novos desafios. Há muitas vozes de ceticismo em relação à política de coesão. A todas elas dizemos que a União não pode sobreviver sem esta política. Com uma reforma audaciosa, centrada nos cidadãos, na previsibilidade, no princípio da parceria e na simplificação, a política de coesão poderá haver reforçado o seu papel de política estrutural e transformadora a longo prazo. Let me now go through three or four main ideas of this opinion. First, we need to find a new balance between the needs for long-term investments on the one hand and the capacity of cohesion policy funding to be agile and responsive to unforeseen events on the other hand. We need regulatory stability from the outset to guarantee fast and effective delivery of the funds. That's what we call flexibility with predictability. Second, the very core principles on which cohesion is built upon, shared management, multi-level governance, partnership principle are more relevant than ever. That's why we propose uh, to reinforce the code of conduct on partnership uh, by creating an enable condition on the partnership principle. Third, to counter those who claim that cohesion policy fund is funding is slow, inefficient or cumbersome, we need to build a new culture of trust and partnership between the EU and our regions and cities based on three pillars, accountability, transparency, participation of all stakeholders. That's why we propose the Commission to launch a wide range assessment of simplification measures. Fourth, we need to address what some observers have coined coordination failure between cohesion policy and the RRF. We cannot afford having cohesion policy competing or overlapping against other EU investments and instruments, I mean, in the future. So we also propose a single strategic framework to define the scope and goal of each fund under what we call the European Partnership Pact. Let me conclude by thanking the, my rapporteur, Francesco Molina. Thank for everybody for um, helping us in this, um, in this um, uh, opinion. Um, and let me express my gratitude to my co-rapporteur, Emile Bock. We have, we had, and we have, 
a strong and very well coordinated partnership not only in this opinion, but I think it's very clear that the fact we are both in f with flu at the same time before you demonstrates how coordinated we are presenting this opinion. Gostava apenas de terminar, Sr. Presidente, fazendo uma referência especial às regiões ultraperiféricas. São regiões que oferecem potencialidades únicas no quadro da UE, da União Europeia. E este parecer salienta o papel fundamental da política de coesão no apoio a estes territórios, face às suas características estruturais permanentes e defende que os desafios específicos inerentes às regiões ultraperiféricas também devem merecer especial cautela, advogando uma atenção particular às questões da acessibilidade territorial, dos transportes, da conectividade, que estão estreitamente interligadas e devem ser tratadas em conjunto com os objetivos da política de coesão. Muito obrigado pela vossa atenção. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, I would like to give the floor now to the co-rapporteur, Mr. Bock, who also has three minutes to intervene. Domnilor președinți, distinsă doamnă comisar, dragi membri ai Comitetului European a Regiunilor, doamnelor și domnilor, de ce este atât de important subiectul pe care îl discutăm astăzi? Pentru că viitorul Uniunii Europene depinde de viitorul politicii de coeziune. Pentru că această politică de coeziune este lipiciul care ține unită Uniunea Europeană. Discuția de astăzi răspunde și la întrebarea ce fel de Uniune Europeană ne dorim în viitor? O Uniune Europeană în care inegalitățile, discrepanțele regionale să se adâncească sau o Uniune Europeană mult mai coezivă cu un minim de standarde de calitate a vieții în fiecare colț al Uniunii Europene. Este adevărat, Statele Unite și unele state din Asia au rate mai mari de creștere economică, dar decât Uniunea Europeană, dar nivelul inegalităților este mult, mult mai mare. Și noi avem un nivel ridicat al inegalităților în Uniunea Europeană, dar incomparabil mai mici cu ceea ce există în alte părți ale lumii. De aceea, dacă dorim să evoluăm spre o coeziune politică, înainte de toate avem nevoie de o puternică coeziune teritorială, economică și socială. Democrația europeană nu se poate consolida în sărăcie. Ea se poate consolida numai acolo unde este prosperitate, nu acolo unde avem foarte puțini, foarte bogați și foarte mulți, foarte săraci, ci acolo unde avem o clasă de mijloc foarte puternică și consolidată cu acces la prosperitate. Acum, prin politica de coeziune trebuie să rămânim un aspect. Nu avem în Europa doar net contributori și net beneficiari. Avem net câștigători în Uniunea Europeană. Europa este marile câștigător al politicii de coeziune. Now I switch to English. What is our vision for the future of cohesion policy? And I will ask you using three letter R. Reinvention of cohesion policy, replacing the cohesion policy, or reinforcing the cohesion policy? Reinvention? No. We need to keep the cohesion policy and long-term investment policy a structural reform of our Europe. Replacing, and especially replacing with another instrument or extending the recovery and resilient facility? No. We should learn from recovery and resilient facility, but not replacing the cohesion policy with a mechanism or recovery and resilient facility. This is the very elephant in the room. If we want to destroy the cohesion policy, then extend the RRF to the cohesion policy. We have to pay attention for that. The RRF is top-down mechanism. Cohesion policy is bottom-up. RRF is an emergency instrument. Cohesion policy is a long-term investment of the European Union. So we have to be very, very careful about this future debate about the future of cohesion policy. Now, reinforcing, of course, we must keep what must be kept, we must avoid what must be avoided, and modernize what we must be modernized. So, very, very quick, what must be kept? A cohesion policy for all regions. 
multi-level governance, place-based approach, partnership principle, and the total cohesion policy budget after 2027 should be at least equivalent to the period 2021-2027. What must be avoided? The fragmentation of cohesion policy, the, the transformation of cohesion policy in the cash machine or in a deposit of money for other emergencies in the European Union. We need, we need flexibility and cohesion, but inside of cohesion funds, not outside of the cohesion funds. And now, in the end, please allow me to thank you to the President Cordeiro for his excellent support. And as a president, he took the, the opportunity and uh, to work together for this important topic for our European Committee of the Regions. And last but not least, to thank you to my uh, expert, Kalihinsi, a professor of political science and public administration in Babes Bay University in Cluj Napoca, a well known, well known recognize, recognized expert in the field. And thank you to all of you, to our shadow rapporteurs, for your support. And last but not least, to the President, allow me to be one minute more. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to open the floor now for our members, and I would like to give the floor for two minutes to Olget Geblevich from the EPP group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to come, uh, thanks to our friends, to uh, Madam Commissioner, to, uh, to Chair Omerji, and to, to Secretary General and uh, Prime Minister to being re real and true defender of the cohesion policy. I would like to also congratulate my friends, co-reporters, for a brilliant job uh, done drafting the, the uh, so important uh, opinion. I. Uh, it is not only voice from the EPP, but it is a voice from my region, from West Pomerania region in Poland, that the uh, uh, importance of the cohesion policy goes far beyond the, its financial support because cohesion policy is true expression of European way of life and our values such as partnership, solidarity, unity and equality, because please believe me, 20 years ago in Poland, in my region, people didn't really believe that common Europe means equal chances. We had the highest unemployment rate, something like 30 percent. We had a huge, large amount of poverty, polluted rivers, and so on. And right now, we managed to rebuild our uh, local economy. We are one of the uh, most cleanest and greenest uh, regions in Poland, producing the, the biggest amount of green energy in Poland. Uh, and it was uh, possible because European money needed to be merged with, uh, uh, with uh, creativity and activity of our people, and then supported by the very hard work of our people on the ground, we are writing the success story. And defending uh, cohesion policy, I think that we always need to keep it in mind that it is not only money. It is about the motivation of people, about the hard work of, of our people, it, about appreciation of this hard work. And my second message is that uh, co cohesion policy needs to be implemented by regional policies, not one regional po European policy, but 242 regional policies, because we cannot drafting the next regulations regarding to, 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 to the next, uh, next uh, MFF, we cannot put every uh, region in the same box. Because even in Poland, when we have 16 of uh, regions, we are very, very diverse. And we need to have wise uh, uh, cohesion, <coughs> and wise cohesion means comprehensive co cohesion. Thank you very thank much. You, Mr. Thank President. you, Mr. President. I would like to give the floor to Sari Rauzio from the EPP for two minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I agree on everything what was said by Mr. Geblevich, but I want to add a few things in Finnish, if you may. Dear friends, uh, cohesio politiikka on EUn ydintä, ja niin se on myös tulevaisuudessa. Sen kautta me määrittelemme, minkälaista Eurooppaa haluamme rakentaa. Kohesiopolitiikan tulee olla pitkäjänteistä, mutta samalla joustavaa suhteessa ympäristömme moninaisiin muutoksiin. Kohesiopolitiikka on paikallis- ja aluelähtöistä tekemistä, muistaen monitasoisen hallinnon periaatteet. Kohesiopolitiikalla toteutetaan yhteisiä eurooppalaisia tavoitteita. Päätökset ja valinnat pitää tehdä siellä, missä 
ihmiset ovat, missä toiminta tapahtuu. Kohesiopolitiikka on ihmisten politiikkaa. Hyvät ystävät, kohesiopolitiikka tarkoittaa uutta eurooppalaista kestävää kasvua ja sosiaalisen osallisuuden vahvistamista. Onnittelen myös raportoijia erinomaisesta työstä. Tämä näkökulma näkyy siinä erinomaisen hyvin. Se vaatii entistä tarkempaa paikkaperusteista tarkastelua, jotta pystytään tunnistamaan niitä alueita, jotka ovat kehitysloukuissa tai taantuvia alueita. Vastakkainasettelua ei tarvita. Me tarvitsemme vahvistuvia kaupunkeja ja maaseutua, tiivistä yhteistyötä näiden välillä. Erilaisten alueiden tarpeet ovat moninaisia erilaisia. Rahoitusohjelmien rakenteiden tulee olla riittävän yksinkertaisia, jotta rahoitettavien toimien yhteensovitus onnistuu. Eli tarvitaan helpompia ja yksinkertaisempia rakenteita niin EU-tasolla, jotta ohjelmien toimintojen yhteensovittaminen on sujuvampaa. Kohesiopolitiikka on pitkäjänteistä työtä ja se ei voi toimia pelkästään kriisivälineenä. Sillä tähdätään myös uusiin innovaatioihin ja esimerkiksi alueellisten älykkään erikoistumisen strategioiden toteutus on hyvä esimerkki kaikkia hyödyntävästä kumppanuudesta. Arvoisa puheenjohtaja, hyvät kohesioystävät, tärkeää on pitää huolta, että joka puolella Eurooppaa voidaan luottaa tulevaisuuteen, että muutos on ihmisille reilu. Ja sitten on hyvä muistaa, että ilman kuntia ja kaupunkeja vihreä ja digitaalinen siirtymä ei onnistu ja kohesiopolitiikka on myös siinä oiva väline. Kiitos. Kiitos, Ms. Rautio. I would like to give the floor now to Isabel Boutino from the Socialist Group. Merci. Merci à tous. Vous l'avez tous dit, la politique de cohésion, c'est tout d'abord une méthode de travail partenariale, de développement autour d'une stratégie territoriale et d'investissement de long terme préparant l'avenir. Et de ce point de vue, nous nous méfions des photos, des photos instantanées que nous fournissent, fournissent les économistes avec leur vision macro et leur obsession de la compétitivité jugée à l'aune du PIB. À ces photos, nous préférons les films, surtout quand ils sont réalisés par des géographes qui ont en tête la valeur ajoutée des coopérations territoriales. C'est pourquoi notre groupe ne cesse d'alerter sur la concurrence que font à la politique de cohésion des outils financiers déconnectés des réalités locales, comme l'a largement été la facilité pour la reprise et la résilience. Seule une gestion décentralisée des fonds de cohésion permet de répondre aux situations économiques, sociales et environnementales spécifiques, car l'enjeu est bien de construire des solutions adaptées aux contextes locaux, que ce soit pour y préserver l'emploi ou pour y opérer les nécessaires transitions énergétiques ou écologiques de façon intelligente et juste. Mais la politique de cohésion devrait être simplifiée afin de relever les nombreux défis du développement territorial. En particulier, nous devons éviter la fragmentation des fonds qui ont chacun leur réglementation différente, ce qui réclame une expertise administrative démultipliée. La politique de cohésion devrait également faire l'objet de plus de médiatisation, être rendue plus visible, et il s'agit donc de mettre l'accent sur sa dimension sociale et de solidarité, alors que les inégalités et le ressentiment qu'elles génèrent rongent la confiance dans les institutions démocratiques. Enfin, nous soutenons l'augmentation des fonds destinés à la coopération territoriale. La coopération transfrontalière en particulier est le lieu où sont régulièrement inventées des politiques publiques innovantes qui font tomber les obstacles juridico-administratifs liés à l'absence de concordance entre les visions nationales des États membres. Il s'agit là aussi d'une belle démonstration de la réussite de la politique de cohésion et ma région, la Nouvelle-Aquitaine, peut en témoigner avec nos régions espagnoles frontalières, Madame la Secrétaire Générale. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Madame Boudino. I would like to give the floor now to President Lamberts. Monsieur le Vice-président, nous nous trouvons cet après-midi ici entre amis, entre amis de la cohésion. Nous sommes convaincus que la politique de cohésion a contribué considérablement au développement européen et nous sommes encore plus convaincus qu'il faudra une cohésion très forte pour les années à venir. Pour nous, la cohésion constitue un élément constitutif de l'ADN de l'Union européenne. L'ADN que nous, les collectivités territoriales, sont appelés à transcrire sur le terrain, là où vivent les gens, là où finalement se décide dans, le, dans la tête, dans l'estomac et dans le cœur des, 
les Européennes et Européens si la politique européenne a une véritable valeur ajoutée pour eux. Mais quand on est entre amis, on oublie parfois qu'on n'a pas que des amis. Dans les États, aussi bien que dans les instances européennes d'ailleurs, tout le monde ne fait pas partie des amis de la cohésion. Il y a ceux qui trouvent qu'elle est superflue, inutile. Puis il y a ceux qui adorent utiliser les moyens de la cohésion comme variable d'ajustement quand il y a quelque part un trou dans le budget européen. C'est avec ceux que nous devons discuter et j'ai un peu le sentiment que cette discussion va nous mener très loin jusqu'à la définition du futur MFF et ça ressemble un peu à un jeu d'échecs. Et messieurs les rapporteurs, vous avez fait pour cela une excellente ouverture. Maintenant, à nous de jouer étape par étape pour que l'objectif final soit euh, celui que nous souhaitons. Souvent, on considère que la politique de cohésion n'est qu'une histoire d'argent. C'est plus que ça, mais c'est aussi ça. Et peut-être moins la répartition des moyens que surtout le volume des moyens. Comment veut-on faire une véritable politique de cohésion si les moyens européens dans l'ensemble ne correspondent qu'à 1% du GDP européen C'est ridicule. Comment veut-on vraiment faire une politique d'investissement si les règles de convergence et les règles budgétaire de l'Union européenne empêche très souvent euh, les investissements. Contre tout cela, il faut aussi se battre et il faut faire beaucoup d'efforts pour que toutes les régions continuent à jouer un rôle effectif dans la politique de cohésion et que l'Europe de demain sera à nouveau euh, une Europe où la cohésion joue un rôle essentiel. Merci beaucoup, Président Lambert. I would like to give the floor to Mirja Verkapera from Renew Europe Group. Hyvä puheenjohtaja, arvoisa komissaari Ferreira. Te, komissaari, teette loistavaa työtä Euroopan kohesiopolitiikan eteen. Ferreira, arvostan työtänne ja sitoutumistanne ja erityisesti tyyliä, jolla puolustatte alueita ja kuntiamme. Euroopan unionin kohesiopolitiikalla on pitkät perinteet ja tarkoitus. Kohesiopolitiikka on haluttu tasata erilaisten pysyvistä olosuhteista johtuvia haittoja ja esteitä, joita Euroopan alueella esiintyy. Niitä ovat esimerkiksi pitkät etäisyydet, maantieteelliset olosuhteet, harva asutus tai sosioekonomiset asema. Politiikalla on haluttu, edistää haitat, äh, on haluttu edistää haittatekijöistä kärsivien alueiden kehitystä. Viesteni on, näin kohesiopolitiikan pitää olla jatkossakin. Omalla alueellani Suomessa on Euroopan unionin kohesiopolitiikalla pystytty parantamaan olosuhteista, olosuhteita yritysten viennin edistämiseksi. On kehitetty digitalisaatiota ja erilaisia energiahankkeita paikallisten ihmisten tarpeisiin. On mahdollistettu yliopiston ja tutkimuslaitosten kehitys- ja innovaatiohankkeita. On edistetty maarajojen yli tapahtuneita, tapahtuvaa yhteistyötä, muun muassa energia- ja ratahankkeilla. Koen, että ilman voimakasta kohesiopolitiikkaa ja rahoitusta oma alueeni ei olisi yhtä kehittynyt ja vetovoimainen kun se tällä hetkellä on. Kunnat ja yritykset uskaltavat investoida omaan tuotantoon ja väkimäärämme kasvaa koko ajan. Renew Europe-ryhmä ryhmä pitää tärkeänä, että politiikka on pitkäjänteistä ja ennustettavaa. Kun valitaan teemat, missiot ja painopisteet, pysytään niissä ja hoidetaan ohjelmien toimeenpano joutuisasti. Sujuvuutta tarvitaan tietysti myös lisää jäsenvaltioihin. Tilapäisiin kriiseihin ja tilanteisiin tarvitaan toinen rahoituskaista. Esimerkiksi koronapandemia tai luonnonkatastrofit pitää hoitaa nopeiden rahoitusinstrumenttien avulla, ei perinteisellä kohesiorahoituksella. 
Odotamme, että tulevan kohesiopolitiikan avulla pystymme alueellamme vastaamaan vihreään siirtymään, digitalisaatioon ja työvoiman saatavuuteen. Edelleenkin saavutettavuus, hyvät kulkuyhteydet, luonnonvarojen kestävä käyttö ja ihmisten osallisuus ovat kärkiteemoja kohesiopolitiikassa. Kiitos. Kiitos. I would like to give the floor now to Jurat Broba from the ECR Group. Uh, dear Madam Commissioner, dear Mr. President, uh, dear honored colleagues, the discussions on the future of the cohesion policy are getting momentum, and I think it's the right time for regions and cities to speak up now. The cohesion policy belongs to our territories and to our citizens. We know the challenges our citizens are facing on the ground, and we are able to propose the measures to address them. Therefore, it is crucial to proactively shape the debates on the future design of this most important EU investment policy already at this very early stage right now. I want to express my gratitude to the co-rapporteurs for the tremendous work <laughs> you have undertaken over the past few months in preparing this opinion. As a shadow rapporteur, I have closely followed the entire process, and I would like to share a few personal remarks with you. Opinions on the future of the cohesion policy have historically held a prominent position among the documents produced by our institution, and rightly so. The document is well balanced, addressing all critical aspects of the cohesion policy, and let me emphasize five key points of the opinion. One. In light of new drivers of inequalities, the upcoming period presents opportunity to redefine how we perceive disparities among regions. It is my strong conviction that in this regard we must move beyond merely considering the GDP mantra. Second, we call for an enhanced application of the integrated territorial investments to strengthen the place-based approach. Three, cohesion policy should be accessible to all EU regions while we uphold the principles of partnership and multi-level governance. Four, a higher focus of the European territorial cooperation is essential. And five, the post-2027 cohesion policy should incorporate a robust urban and metropolitan dimension. In collaboration with my colleagues from Capital Cities and Regions Network, we have prepared also a position paper on this issue. I am pleased that through this opinion we can send a powerful political message regarding our vision for the cohesion policy. The adoption of the opinion is just the start. However, I am confident that the dedication of the rapporteurs will help convey this message to the key European institutions and succeed. Cohesion is the bloodline of our regions, and uh, as Mr. Lamberts put it, it's the DNA, and I completely agree with that. Europe needs to see success stories, and cohesion policy shows us the most tangible success stories that people see and present the best European Union in their eyes. I, am a, I call myself a matured libertarian, and although I like small government, I do see the inevitability of the cohesion policy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Droba. Kieran McCarthy, please. You have the floor. Yeah, last week, Tehran, Commissioner Kahir Lakhishta Regi, Marad Vera Kahar Korki, Tastiam Um Gumek Forbert Karka, a Kriglar Policy Europig, Yahong Eglort Infrastructure in a mass chorus umper August Kalafort, August Tomic Lord Fien Deshna, Krohula Dina, Kamad Sakahar, Deshna Tihtikta, Deshna Sarvisha, Daard Kardan, and Tipluk Gomegfa Brodulask. The needs for cohesion policy are evolving. Uh, especially with the demands of the green and digital transition. Automation will have an impact across regions. It will create new jobs in a region, but benefits, benefits will not be dis distributed equally. Uh, regional labour markets could be seriously impacted. And we have new challenges. There are new forms of disparities that can arise to social tension um, if, they, if they remain unaddressed. And these challenges can go beyond borders, cannot be tackled by member states alone, but in partnership with the regions. And while inside this room we are all in agreement uh, and I agree with you, uh, Madam Commissioner. I think it's outside this room that work needs to be done, and we need to do more to defend the key principles that our two distinguished rapporteurs have brilliantly included in the opinion. But the magnitude of the challenges are huge and needs adequate budget, so we need no more budget transfer. 
Um, and how many times do the C- does the COR have to articulate on the importance of the partnership principle? Um, the proliferation of instruments and centrally managed instruments are not friends of local democracy. Uh, we need to do more um, so that, our greater, that there's greater co- cooperation with European Parliament committees and that they will grow stronger. We need to do more to work proactively, as we're doing with the Spanish and future presidencies, to keep cohesion policy in focus. We need to do more with national governments. We need to do more by building allies and networks within the co- cohesion alliance. In essence, we need to do more as the Committee of the Regions. My sincere thanks uh, to the two distinguished uh, rapporteurs uh, and get well soon. Thank you very much. Una Power from the Greens, you have the floor. Thank you. And first of all, on behalf of the Greens, I'd like to thank the rapporteurs for their constructive and forward-looking work on this report. It is very welcome. And thank you as well to the panellists for an engaging and insightful discussion. Cohesion policy is, as we know, an incredibly important investment tool to reduce social, territorial and economic diverse, er, disparities. But it is also a huge asset in our arsenal when it comes to combating climate change and environmental degradation. For the post-27 cohesion policy, we need to aim for half of the budget to not only contribute to climate change ad- adaptation and mitigation, but also to halting biodiversity loss, building better water management and implementing a circular economy. Furthermore, no cohesion funding should be used in a way that is counter to our climate and environmental goals. New climate adaptation earmarking within the cohesion policy would be particularly important, allowing regions to take action to tackle challenges related to climate change and to build up their resilience and preparedness regarding environmental issues and disasters. Finally, as has already been mentioned, GDP alone is not an adequate metric by which to measure the state of health of European regions. A European Policy Centre study for the Reggie Committee confirmed that there is a widening economic, social and territorial divide within our Union. Better performing economies and positive growth rates do not necessarily translate into better services or better quality of life for our citizens. We must advocate for a more holistic approach that considers a spectrum of indicators to provide a comprehensive understanding of regional well-being and to guide more effective policy interventions. Thank you again to the rapporteurs for their work on this. Thank you very much, Ms. Green. I would like to give the floor now to Elisa Ferreira, our Commissioner, for her reaction. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the comments that were made. Uh, I will not react to all of them. I'll just like to underline. Um, But we took note of everything that uh, that, uh, the different members have been saying. And, of course, we are listening and studying uh, not only the texts and contributions that come from the high-level group, but from all the different member states, all the different think tanks across Europe, and particularly, as Mr. Homaji mentioned, we, are, we know that the future of cohesion policy has got to make a statement on lessons learned from the past, on what is our legacy, but it is up to the next Commission, to the Parliament and to the Council to decide what kind of policy will be uh, the one that will be prevailing. What I would like to underline is that more and more we see the recognition of the value of the policy from external entities, independent entities. And namely, I like very much to quote the World Bank when they say that Europe has a convergence machine, uh, whereas others uh, classify cohesion policy as the glue that keeps Europe together. And if you look at the global trends that we are faced with, we see how uh, the demography is changing the shape of Europe. Uh, Our estimates are that in 2050, 
there will be less 35 million active population inside Europe. This is a big country that will disappear naturally. So this calls for also an emergency action in order to tackle this hemorrhage of people that are qualified and they cannot leave and find a proper job in the place where they were born or where well they would like to work. Also, we have connected uh, with uh, our uh, work on rural areas. Uh, we have established a lot of information that uh, I call you to include in your analysis, in fact, on the different situations that different regions face. So we have the global demographic trend, we have the climate emergency, and I would like to underline that, in fact, the biggest public investment in uh, uh, environment projects, as well as in digital, comes exactly from cohesion policy because we have made sure that there is this kind of concern of attention in relation to the future of Europe and to the future of our regions. Of course, we would love and we are hoping that also the proposals on STEP, on the capacity to attract future-oriented high-level industries can really also benefit the different regions and different countries of Europe. Let's see what uh, the Council uh, and the European Parliament decide finally on this issue. So there are lots of trends, lots of shocks. I would like also to share with you that uh, from uh, our past initiatives that we managed to do with the strong support of the Parliament and of the Committee of Regions and Council, uh, with the support uh, of reshifting or allowing to shift cohesion funding to address the emergency situations of COVID or of the, uh, of the accommodation of, of refugees from Ukraine with these emergency funds helped us to have a different situation in relation of 2021 when compared with the previous crisis of 2011 and 12. What I mean with this is that after this crisis of 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, when we, regions bounced back, they bounced back, particularly those that were stronger, the weakest one, they lagged behind. Uh, in the present case, in 2021, all the regions, the weakest and the strongest, they had bounced back in 2021, and they had already the GDP per capita on average that they had before the pandemic. So this shows that also we need to accommodate in cohesion policy these uh, elements that uh, will help us to react, but the purpose is not in question. The central purpose of the policy is long-term convergence. And also here, if you look at the countries that joined the European Union in the recent enlargements, they had a GDP per capita on average lower than 50 percent. I just came from Romania. Romania in uh, to, in the year 2000, had a GDP per capita compared with the average of Europe of 27 percent. Today, Romania has 77 percent uh, of, of, of GDP per capita. And on average, these countries have reached a level that is over 75 percent. So if you need evidence of the role of cohesion policy, you have lots of examples. The crucial thing is that particularly now in a campaign period, that in fact when citizens ask questions about Europe, that in fact we make in concrete uh, we give visibility to what cohesion policy has changed. And I would like to underline uh, a sentence in the report that uh, is uh, under appreciation now. And this is, let's analyze what is the cost of no cohesion. So if cohesion policy was not there, how would the life of people change? or have changed. This is something that I value very much as a principle 
to understand how important cohesion is in the sense of keeping Europe together. It is the glue that keeps Europe together. Of course, all your recommendations are listened to, and in particular, I'd like to reinforce this place-based approach, this need to have the partnership, to involve the local entities, to have a bottom-up approach, to have a multi-level recognition, and to make sure that cohesion is not an issue to be done by cohesion policy, but it is at the core of our democrat democratic, uh, democratic process at the level of the European Union, but also at the level of each member state. Without it, cohesion, without cohesion, Europe is fragmented, and a fragmented Europe is not a strong Europe. So thank you very much for your support. And I finalize with my appeal. Let's make cohesion policy visible to our citizens. Let's make cohesion policy understandable by those that are not experts or directly engaged into the policy. Thank you so much for your work. I cannot follow up here because I have another commitment. But anyway, colleagues are following and will take note of all your contributions. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ferreira. It is a pleasure always to work with you. Uh, we know very well here in the Committee of Regions, and I personally know that uh, very well as well, that you are a good friend, supporter, and ally of the European Committee of Regions and, of course, of cohesion policy. And we thank you for that. Thank you very much.